What's going on, everybody? We're out here again in the woods looking for some dinner. I've been walking around for a little bit, and I had just got some morels out of here a few days ago, and I was hoping to maybe find some more. We had a thunderstorm the other evening, and a lot of times morels will pop up after a storm. I've been out here looking, and a lot of the lower growing plants have really popped up with all of this rain, and it's making it really hard to hunt for mushrooms. So I think I'm going to shift gears and I have an idea what might be a suitable dinner. So in my first video ever, uh, I had talked about stinging nettle and wood nettle and how they're, they're different but very similar. I don't see a lot of stinging nettle, but I am seeing a lot of wood nettle. So I think we might be able to do something with that. We're gonna poke around and look for some other things to see if we can round out this meal idea that I have. In the meantime, stick with me and let's see what we can find. Okay, so here we've got some wood nettle. If you remember, you know, we've got these leaves that are pretty serrated, a little bit fuzzy, and then we have the stem, which has all these tiny hairs. Now, those tiny hairs are like little hypodermic needles, and they have a histamine inside of them that causes a minor allergic reaction. And uh, in the interest of trying to show all the viewers what that looks like uh, when it occurs, I'm going to go ahead and sting myself with this wood nettle. So I'll give you a before and after of my arm. So right here, my arm, you can see no bumps, nothing like that. Just a hairy arm. All right. We're going to go in here and we're going to touch our arm to those spikes. Ouch. All right. So we touched it. Now we just got to wait a little bit. You can probably see that I have been itching it a little bit. I'll admit the reaction's not as bad as what I'm used to getting. Usually you get like these little raised bumps that are pretty itchy. I don't really see any raised bumps this time. It's just kind of itchy, but it goes away in like 10, 15 minutes. It's really not that bad. Just like stinging nettle, you want to harvest just kind of the tops of these plants, at least when they're this age. When they're a little bit younger, you might be able to harvest the whole plant or the majority of the plant but these are starting to exceed 10 12 inches so the top portions are what we're going to be interested in uh, for culinary purposes so here we have two plants and uh, because i wasn't planning on harvesting any wood nettle today i didn't bring gloves and i didn't bring a knife so we're just gonna have to suck it up on this one there is a trick so these hairs point in a downward direction and if you kind of slide down the stem, really not gonna get, you're not gonna get punctured too badly. Uh, so here you can see this is about how much I'm gonna take, throw those in my bag, and we'll walk around and just harvest. Oh, pulling that one out by the root. We'll harvest, uh, oh, a couple cups worth of this probably to make what I'm planning on. Okay, as I've been out here harvesting, uh, I looked down at my wrist and realized that the nettle stings have progressed a little bit. So, see if we can see that on camera. You might be able to see those, those bumps now. And honestly, uh, they look like they should be really itchy, but right now, they don't even itch anymore. I don't know if you can tell in this video or not, but there is literally wood nettle covering the forest floor here. Basically, I would say 65-70% of what you see is wood nettle in various growth stages. 
Really, the only difference between wood nettle and stinging nettle is that the leaves are opposite on stinging nettle and they're alternate on wood nettle. So you can see here on this plant, we've got a leaf coming off here and then another one here. And if this was stinging nettle, they would be coming out of the same node or coming out of the same location. So we know this is wood nettle. All right, I've been walking around collecting this wood nettle and I think I found our second plant we're gonna throw in here. I, again, I did these in a previous video, but they're a, one of the native alliums. Uh, these are most similar to a green onion. And uh, right now they're kind of like getting ready to flower or something. All right, so I'll take a look at this. This is our native onion right here. You can see they have these uh, kind of like flower heads on them. I'm not sure if, I don't think they're like uh, Egyptian onions or bunching onions where these will turn into a bunch of small onions, fall off, and then start new plants. I think this is a flower and then it turns into seeds, but I could be wrong. Let me know in the comments if you know. Uh, but we're going to collect just some of these leaves right here, the flat leaves. And, you know, just to always make sure that we know what we have here, we'll rip one off and we'll smell it unmistakably an onion. So we'll go ahead and collect some of these. As we're collecting, you know, every one of these flowers or whatever these are that we see is a separate plant. So there's three, four plants here. And I don't want to take all the leaves from one plant because we would like these to reproduce. So I'm taking like, on the bigger plants, I'll take two leaves. On the smaller plants, probably just one. All right, now that I totally smell like onions, I think we've got enough. We're gonna throw those in the bag with the wood nettle and keep on trucking through here. Okay, I think I found what might be the last thing I'm gonna to add to this meal. Oh, it's a red tail hawk flying. Pretty cool. At any rate, I think I found the last thing we're gonna to add to this meal here. It is a mushroom. It's kind of odd to see it this time of year. It's Enoki, uh, Flamulina volutipes is the Latin name. And uh, it's often called the velvet foot or velvet shank mushroom. I'm not gonna go over the details on identifying this because it has a deadly poisonous look-alike and something like this deserves a video of its own. But we'll go over here, we'll take a look at it. I'll show you what I'm gonna harvest. Okay, here they are growing on a fallen tree. Uh, this tree fell last fall. Did you guys hear that red-tailed hawk? Terrifying sound. Anyway, um, these, these are typically eaten uh, in Asian culture, very common to have them in like ramen and stuff. But when you see them in the store, they're usually white, bleached white. And that's because they're harvested when they're still underneath the bark. You peel the bark off and then you can find the young ones there. So they change color when they get exposed to the sun. Uh, I personally don't really care if they are unopened or bleached or anything like that, I will still eat them even when they're this large. So we're gonna go ahead and harvest as many of these as we can. All right, I pulled one off here and you might be able to tell why they call these the velvet shank or velvet foot. There's these tiny black hairs that grow from the base of these. Enoki are traditionally a winter mushroom, like late fall through winter. They like colder temperatures. Um, and they have actually some interesting features that allows them to grow in those freezing, right below freezing temperatures. But Ohio's weather has been really weird this spring, so they popped up even though right now it's sunny and 70 degrees. So uh, we'll, we'll take advantage of it. Uh, they're not my absolute favorite mushroom, but they're pretty darn good. All right, we've got our bag of goodies here. We've got our mushrooms, our wood nettle, and our wild onion. And we're ready to bring those inside, get them cleaned up, and start prepping this food. All right, we are in the kitchen, and today you guys actually get to see me and hear me prep and cook in the kitchen. We've got our plants and our mushrooms in this bag that we just foraged, and we're gonna start getting some things together. We're gonna make no gnocchi, gnocchi, somebody Italian, <laughs> help me out, however you say it. 
basically it's a potato dough that you make into a, a pasta. So I've got a few potatoes here cleaned and you wanna bake these or microwave them. I would advise against boiling them uh, just because you end up having to add so much more flour when you go to make the dough. And that makes the dough a little bit more difficult to deal with when you want to start actually rolling out the gnocchi. All right, so we're gonna take our potatoes. We're gonna go bring those down to the microwave and cook them until they're soft. While the potatoes are cooking, we're going to fill a pot with some water and start getting these greens uh, cooked down. What that means is we're gonna get some water boiling and then we're going to throw a strainer into the water, throw our vegetables in there, cook them for two, three minutes. All right, as always, we are going to wash our greens. I'm just gonna throw them into this strainer and run them under some water, massage them with my fingers. I tried to clean them in the field as best I could. If there were leaves stuck to them or whatever, I tried to clean those off. Uh, we are not gonna put the mushrooms in here, just the plants. All right, we're gonna go run these under some cold water and uh, get them cleaned up a little bit. All right, nice and clean. Just kind of get them dried off a, a little bit here. And we'll set those on the stove. And as soon as that water gets boiling, we will get them in. All right, we got our baked potatoes that are done. And we're gonna let those cool because they are hot. We've got our mushrooms that I've taken out of the bag here. These enoki are notoriously sticky. So we need to clean them pretty well. I'm just gonna run the tops underneath cold water and try to scrub the dirt off with my fingers. And then we'll place them in here once they have been clean. We'll cut the stems off of them after we've got them cleaned. All right, our water is boiling. So we're gonna go ahead and get our greens in there. All right, I think our greens are cooked thoroughly, should be soft enough. I'm gonna go ahead and throw the strainer in the sink and strain out the greens. All right, they always like to hold on to a little extra moisture even after you've put them through a strainer. So I tend to scrape them into a corner of the strainer and just kind of give them a little press, push out some of that residual moisture. All right, we are going to take our food processor and fill it with our greens and the insides of the potatoes. I find that when you cook the potatoes in the microwave, the skin tends to dry up and come off of the potato. And so uh, it's a little bit easier to deal with in my opinion, but to each their own. Maybe I just haven't spent enough time cooking potatoes in the oven. All right, so we got that potato about as clean as it's gonna get. Plop that into our food processor. Shave a little bit off this one. Okay, should be good. Start peeling this one. All right, we've got our potatoes and our greens in the food processor. We're gonna go blend that together until it's all well incorporated. 
All right, here we got it all blended together. We're gonna crack an egg just so everything sticks together and blend that up again. Here we're gonna add our blended up nettles and egg and potato with some flour. And you wanna use just enough flour that everything sticks together and it's not too tacky. And then we'll mix all that together. Sorry for changing over to this microphone. It's gonna bounce back and forth a couple times. Uh, my wife and daughter came home while I was making this meal, so I had to kind of cut parts in and out where you could hear my daughter screaming in the background or me talking to my wife, so. I forgot to add salt, so we're gonna go ahead and do that after we knead it, and we're just gonna mix that in. All right, we've got our enoki cleaned up here. And we're going to go ahead and take off any of the stems that look like this where they're black. They're going to be pretty fibrous. So we're going to go ahead and get rid of those. Just like so. So in a lot of these, it'll just be the caps. Okay, this is what we've got left after we've taken a lot of the stipes or the stems off. You know, something like, like this still has a stem on it. And uh, it hasn't really changed color. Maybe rip that little piece off. It hasn't really changed color in this upper portion of the stem, so in my opinion, that's fine to eat. You know, another thing I had said earlier that people like to harvest these when they're still white or still underneath the bark, um, and that's fine. I mean, it makes it so the entire mushroom, the stem and the top, the cap, are all uh, more desirable in texture, but when they get exposed to sunlight, they produce vitamin D internally and it's a bioavailable form of vitamin D to us. So I, I mean, there's benefits to both, you know, culinary purposes, there's benefits to having the, the bleached mushrooms uh, from a micronutrient profile, you know, having the ones that have been exposed to sunlight also has a benefit. So to each their own, I'm just here to show you that you can eat mushrooms that a lot of people would tell you are past their prime. However, that being said, there are times where mushrooms are truly past their prime and should not be consumed. So make sure you know where those limits are. And if you continue to watch my videos, hopefully I'll be able to illustrate some of those limits. All right, here we're just going to cut up our Brussels sprouts. We're gonna take the bottoms off and then have them. When you have them, a lot of times some of the outer leaves wanna come off. Just go ahead and peel those off ahead of time. And we're gonna get through all our Brussels sprouts here All right, all the Brussels sprouts are cut up. We're gonna get a pan with some melting butter on a low temperature. We're gonna put those Brussels sprouts face down. It's just gonna allow that face to absorb a lot of the butter. Again, we're not at a high temperature yet. So I got all these soaking in some butter. We'll go ahead and flip them over and add garlic powder, some onion powder, And we just wanna cover the face of these so we get like a good crispy edge. We'll go ahead and add some salt to help get rid of some of the extra moisture. And then we're gonna flip these back over on their face so they can fry with all those seasonings in direct contact with the, uh, the pan. And that should give us a nice crust We'll put a lid on for like the first five or six minutes to let those steam. Here we've got our dough. I've got it covered in flour. We're gonna cut some workable pieces down to size and then we'll roll that out and we'll start cutting our gnocchi. This part can be a little bit tedious, but it's definitely worth it. And you'll see here at this first like cut or two that it's a little stringy. Some There were some pieces at the beginning that did have a little bit extra um, plant material, kind of not fully chopped up the way I would have liked. But after we cook it, it won't matter. All that will soften and it won't, it won't provide a weird texture. We're going to go ahead and fry up some bacon. Put our bacon on. Brussels sprouts are still under cover and we're boiling some water. We're 
We're going to add our noodles to that boiling water shortly. Do take care to watch the pot as you're boiling these uh, noodles, these potato dumplings or whatever you want to consider them. They uh, have a tendency to boil over very quickly if you don't pay attention. All right, we got our bacon starting to get nice and fried, and we're going to go ahead and add our mushrooms. In my opinion, this was a mistake I made. I kind of went against my own rule, which is you always want to dry fry mushrooms to get out a lot of the moisture at the beginning, and I just didn't do that. So I put them in here with the oil and they never really get rid of enough moisture, especially because they're already so kind of slippery or gooey as it is. You really want to cook them well with dry heat so that they don't get slimy and I kind of let them get slimy. We're going to go ahead and add our gnocchi to our cooked mushrooms. I'm gonna give our Brussels sprouts a stir. They didn't get the crust I quite wanted because I left the lid on for too long. But we'll go ahead and add a little bit of blue cheese dressing. Fresh blue cheese is better here, but I never go through it fast enough to merit purchasing it, so blue cheese dressing is a good substitute. And a high quality balsamic vinegar uh, will make a big difference here, but any balsamic vinegar will do. And you just wanna add enough. You don't wanna soak these and have them swimming in your sauce, but you want enough to coat them. And if you have a little bit too much, you can always cook them a little bit longer and evaporate off some of that moisture. All right, you can see we added bacon and sour cream to the gnocchi and we have our Brussels sprouts. This was a pretty good meal. Um, the only thing I would do different is maybe make the bacon grease kind of more of a sauce with some cream and some cheese. It was a little bit lacking in terms of texture.